Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and God's blessing be with you. It's an honour to be able to speak on the subject of the preservation of the Bible and the Quran. When Christians and Muslims discuss ideas, they often quote from their holy books, the Bible for the Christians and the Quran and Hadith for the Muslim. When we are having these discussions, there are often two assumptions that the Muslim has. The first is that the Quran is perfect. Let me quote from some Islamic teachers. The Quran was memorized by Muhammad and then dictated to his companions and written down by scribes who cross-checked it during his lifetime. Not one word of its 114 chapters have ever been changed over the centuries. Or again, no other book in the world can, can, can match the Quran. The astonishing fact about the Book of Allah is that it has remained unchanged even to a dot over the last 1400 years. No variation of text can be found in it. But when it comes to the Bible, there's a different assumption that is there. Again, let me quote from an Islamic teacher. The books that are in the hands of the people of the book, the Christians and Jews today, should not be viewed as authentic because they have been distorted, altered and tampered with. These are the, these are the assumptions that many Muslims have when discussing matters with Christians. Now, it matters for three reasons, this. Firstly, it actually stops discussion. Because a Christian may quote something from one of the prophets, but the Muslim easily just dismisses it because they had this assumption. It's also important, secondly, because Muslims will say that they believe all the prophets. And yet from the Christian perspective, in practice, what we see Muslims doing is, is not reading those prophets. And so it doesn't seem that they really believe them. And thirdly, it matters because it's how we determine what the message of the prophets are. And we want to know what the message of the prophets are. And so for one group to be saying your book's crutter than the other not, it affects how we come to that decision. So tonight, we're discussing a very important issue, and I want to begin with the preservation of the Quran. Now, Islam is based on the Quran and the Hadith, but tonight I'm just considering the Quran and its preservation. The preservation of the Hadith would be an important issue, but we won't do that tonight. Now, regarding the preservation of the Quran, we're told that it was a, a matter of simple dictation, and then it was perfectly memorised, and preserved by Muhammad's followers. But there's actually more to it than this. I want to read us from a, a hadith here from Imam Bukhari, and I'll be quoting from these types of sources tonight. Narrated by Al-Bara, there was revealed, not equal are those believers who sit at home and those who strive and fight in Allah's cause. So from Surah 4, verse 95. The prophet said, Call Zaid for me and let him bring the board and the ink pot and the scapula bone, that is the writing equipment. Then he said, Write, not equal to those believers who sit and uh, to, to those who sit. And at that, tie, at that time, Ami um, bin um, Maktam, the blind man, was sitting beside the prophet. He said, O oh, Allah's apostle, what is your order for me as regard the above verses? I am a blind man. So instead of the above verse, the following verse was revealed. Not equal are those believers who sit at home, except those who are disabled by an injury or blind or lame, and those who strive and fight in Allah's cause. So we see that the, there was the first version of the verse, Surah 4, verse 95, and then a later, we could even say an improved version to cover other situations. Now this type of changing of, of what Muhammad recited happened so often that it, it made the Meccans uh, comment about it and were critical of him and it actually evoked a response in the Quran itself. And so we, we read here, and when we exchange a verse in place of another and God knows very well what he is sending down, they say to Muhammad, thou art a mere forger. So you can see how th this issue of changing what he was saying actually was noticed by those around him and uh, a verse needed to be revealed. Uh, he needed to say a verse to cover this. This shows that the Quran was fluid during Muhammad's lifetime and its preservation was not simply dictation and, uh, and memorization, as certain parts were revised. My next point is that Muhammad never collected the Quran into one volume and this caused preservation problems. Let me just read to you from the Hadith again, narrated by Zaid bin Thabit. I suggest you, O Abu Bakr, order that the Quran be collected. I said to Umar, how can you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? See, Muhammad never compiled the Quran into a, a final volume. It was his companions who collected the Quran into one book, but they had memorized the Quran differently. 
Again, consider this hadith narrated by Ibrahim. The companions of Abdullah ibn Masud came to Abu Dada, and before they arrived at his home, he looked for them and found them. Then he asked, who among you can recite the Quran as Abdullah recites it? They replied, all of us. He asked, who among you knows it by heart? They pointed at al -Kama. And he asked al -Kama, how did you hear Abdullah ibn Masud reciting Surat al uh, al -Akma replied, al uh, recited, by the male and the female. That's a certain verse from the Quran. Abu Adar said, I testify that I heard the prophet reciting it likewise. But these people, this is in Iraq, want me to recite it by him who created male and female. And by Allah, I will not follow them. You see, Muhammad's companions did preserve the Quran by memorizing it, but the Hadith itself testifies to it being memorized differently. These different versions of the Quran began to cause trouble among the Islamic community. And so the third Caliph, Uthman, solved this problem by burning all of these other versions and making one standard version. We read, Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what he had copied and ordered that all other Quranic materials whether written in fragmentary manuscript or copies, be burnt. Now, most of the companions did receive and accept Muhammad's standard version of the Quran. However, not all of them did. And so, again, we meet uh, Abdullah ibn Masud again. And it says here in the Sahih Muslim, Abdullah ibn Masud reported that he said to his companions to conceal their copies of the Quran. And so they didn't give them up for burning. Now, the differences between these different versions of the Quran was a subject of many of the early uh, scholars of Islam in the classical period. A particular librarian named Abi uh, Yaqab al-Nadim was a librarian who made a catalogue of the Arabic books in the year 377 AH or 987 AD. And in doing so, he actually goes around and uh, collects Qurans from different locations and he gives different lists of the different surahs that were in them. And he, he notices that the surahs are in different order and sometimes have extra surahs or fewer surahs. In fact, he makes an entry in his catalogue on this. And the title of the entry is uh, The Books Composed About the Discrepancies in the Quranic Manuscripts. And it goes through all these different main capital cities of the Islamic Empire. And there were seven books that he lists in his catalogue uh, recording these. When these Islamic scholars uh, uh, are quoted either directly or uh, from later people who use them, we see that they say about these early versions of the Quran that the number of surahs varied between 110 and 111. The order of the surahs were different. Sometimes the verses had different number of words or words in different orders. And they also had a different, at, um, a different attitude to the, to the Bismillah and whether or not it was part of the Quran. Therefore, the, Historically, the preservation of the Quran is not as many Islamic leaders tell us. There were different memorized versions of the Quran with different canons of surahs, different numbers, and a standard version was made and the others were burnt. I'd now like to look at the, uh, the current situation with the Quran. As I quoted before, Christians are often told that the Qurans around the world are absolutely identical. However, this is not the case. There are different versions or readings in the Arabic Qira'at of the Quran used around the world. These Qira'at are famous recordings of how 10 famous men recited the Quran. If you actually want to read the Quran, you have to read it according to one of these famous reciters. The most popular one is the one standardized by the Islamic Empire, and that is by uh, Imam uh, Hafs. And so this is the one that is used in the majority of the Islamic world. But Warsh, uh, according to the Quran, according to Imam Warsh, is the Arabic Quran used uh, in most of North Africa. And Imam Kalun's version is in Algeria. And Al-Juri is in the Sudan. But as I said, there are 10 accepted versions. It's often said by Islamic leaders that these different versions are only different in terms of accent. But this is actually not the case. If we just consider verse, uh, ch chapter 21, verse 4, the top Arabic there is from Warsh, and uh, I'll see how my Arabic goes. It's uh, kul, rabi, yai, lamu, something like that, forgive me. And that means, say, my Lord knows. 
And so in, in, that, in the wash transmission, it's God saying say, which is a, a phrase that is often in the Quran. But in the Huff's transmission, it says, Kala Rabi, Ya Lamu, which is he said, my Lord knows. This may seem like a small change, but it changes the subject of the sentence from God to Muhammad. There are actually uh, 10 of these versions, as I said before, and there are Qurans you can get. They're not easy to get, which have the variants of all the 10 listed in the margins. And there are over 4,000 differences between these authorised versions. Another difference between these Qurans is the Bismillah. This is the, uh, the introduction that you read at the beginning of the surahs of the Quran, saying, in the name of Allah the Merciful and the Compassionate. Now, it's interesting that amongst these 10 authorised versions, they don't all accept the Bismillah as actually part of the Quran. And so we read here in this Islamic scholar saying, the readers themselves differ over whether the Bismillah was a verse in uh, Surah Fatiha and the other surahs among the, the readers Ibn Kathir, Azim and al kazi were the only ones who considered it to be a verse uh, at the beginning of each surah, whereas the others did not. And so the exact knowledge about the Bismillah and whether or not it's actually part of the Quran uh, has not been preserved. Now, the majority of Muslims in practice in the world following the Hafs transmission take this as the first part of the verse of each surah, except Surah 9. But with the Wash transmission and actually the majority of the readers it is just like uh, one of the titles that is put there. It's actually just what is said as a way of introducing it, but not part of the Quran itself. Uh, therefore, there are actually differences between the modern Qurans in various ways. We've also got the ancient manuscripts that we can look at, the manuscripts from the Samarkand manuscript, the, the new recent discoveries in Sana'a uh, in Yemen, the Bankipur Codex and the Topapi. Uh, manuscript in Egypt. Uh, some of these claim to be written by Uthman, others not. But amongst all of them, there are variants to what is in the modern Quran today. And so it is just not true when Islamic leaders say that the, the, what they say about the Quran, in that it is perfect and free in, from any variation and uh, has just come simply to us. But I'm not going to exaggerate it either. I do not believe that the Quran is totally corrupt. I'm not trying to say that. The differences do not change the overall meaning of the Quran, and it seems to be a credible record of what Muhammad recited. What I am asking for, though, is that people, uh, that Islamic leaders in particular, stop exaggerating this point. The next point I want to move on to is the Bible. Now, the Bible is a collection of 66 books from around 40 different prophets. It's not just from one time, from the time of Jesus but it's from the time of Moses right through to Jesus and his disciples over about a 1,500-year period. And in the case of each of these books, each of these individual books have their own history as to how they were preserved. So the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, begin with Moses himself receiving the law from God, uh, speaking with God face to face, receiving the Ten Commandments on the mountain. But we also see as we read the, the later books of Joshua and 1 Samuel that other prophets were also involved in, uh, in the preservation and addition to the books of Moses. And so the books of Moses become a work of a number of prophets according to the Bible. The Psalms of David were also used in the temple and preserved within that area. There were prophets like Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Daniel who we read in the Bible. And often we're told about their scribe who was with them or that they had a school of prophets with them. And these people were responsible for keeping their, uh, the, the, the words that they said uh, preserved. After the exile for Israel, uh, that, that was a time when Israel was banished from the land and suffered uh, greatly. And it was when they start to come back that they begin, it seems, to gather all of these uh, books together, these different scrolls that they have. And we have a reference to Nehemiah collecting these books together. When we want to have a list of exactly what these books are, we can't find really any early list. We certainly get references to the fact that they had scriptures, but to get a complete list, we've really got to wait to the, the period of the, uh, of the early centuries of the Christian era. And uh, just as the early Muslims had to discuss the canon of what was in the Quran and which surahs were in and which weren't. It was the same with the, with the Bible as well, with the Old Testament. When we consider the Gospel, now moving to the New Testament, we see that uh, Jesus sent his apostles to the nations, 
and we actually know where they went to these different areas. They were his students and they preserved his teachings. The apostles of Jesus actually did miracles as Jesus did and they were the living witness to Jesus. They were prophets themselves. They told the story of Jesus and established an oral tradition. We read in 2 Peter 1.15 that our Peter himself was making preparations so that the things he had said would be preserved. And so from a historical point of view, the church had this oral tradition and then this oral tradition was placed into the writing of the Gospels, probably with, with, the, with the death of the apostles. The letters that we also find in the New Testament are letters actually written by the apostles themselves. They're different to the Gospels, which record Jesus' life. These are written from the apostles as authoritative statements to the churches. Now, these letters themselves, they were often written to uh, large areas. So at the beginning of 1 Peter, we read that he sent his letter to all of modern day Turkey. And in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, we read how uh, Paul commands the church to make a copy of the letter he sent them and to send it on to another church. And it was through this process that these letters were passed around and distributed amongst the churches. But in time, it became necessary to finalise and to, to make a clear statement as to what these actual documents were. There were people like Marcion who were saying he didn't accept the Gospels. And uh, he, only, he didn't accept any of the prophets who were before Jesus. And he, he only accepted certain things. There was also the question of uh, Christians doing mission to other cultures. And they wanted to know which books do we translate. There was also persecution by Roman emperors. And so you wanted to know which books you had to protect. There were false gospels that were written. There were false letters in the apostles' names that were written. But there were also good, good letters that had been written by Christian leaders as well. So there were many good letters like the Epistle of Barnabas and other documents which weren't wrong, but yet they weren't apostolic. And so the church leaders, in various discussions, very often at an informal level, they certainly didn't have a, a council just on this subject, uh, began to publish lists in the 2nd, 3rd to the 6th century to state which books were, were genuine. Now, this was not a straightforward process. It required work and discussion to work these matters out. They were looking at matters like... Uh, could, could, could it be proven that it was written by one of the apostles? Was there a chain of, uh, of testimony going back from one disciple to another disciple, back to the apostle, a chain of narration back to say that this was a genuine letter from them or a genuine gospel? Uh, th it, did it conform? The second point was, did it conform to the rule of faith? And th that is, did it uh, agree with what the Old Testament prophets had said? And had the document a history of being continuously used in the, used in the church at large? Again, I don't want to exaggerate this because we can exaggerate it both ways. Sometimes Christians can say that it was just a seamless process, that the whole thing was nice and simple. It wasn't that simple. But neither should we exaggerate it because in the end, I think they only discussed about 15% of the New Testament. Uh, most of it just wasn't even discussed. But there was 15% and that needs to be said. I just thought I'd give you a quick example of one of them from the Gospel of Thomas. This is often quoted today, and you can see why the church left it. In fact, there are similar types of quotes in all the Gospels. So we read here, um, uh, it says here, Simon Peter says to them, Let Mary go out from our midst, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, See, I will draw her so as to make her male, so that she also may become a living spirit like you males. For every woman who has become a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that is so far from what the gospel teaches about it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, you can be saved. And it's so far from the Old Testament, which says that God made male and female in his image. And so when we look at these other gospels, you can actually see why they didn't preserve them and, and include them. Another point I want to look at is who had control over the Bible. Now, this matters because you need to have control over something in order to change it. But the New Testament in particular has never been in one set of hands. Most people think that the Roman Catholic Church holds all power in Christianity and that it can do what it's like, but this is not the case. It is a major section of the Christian church, but there are also, there's also the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Egyptian Church, the, uh, the Ethiopian Church, each with its own government. Some people think that Emperor Constantine changed it, but this is historically not true. He didn't even control all of the regions of Christianity and he didn't make those types of direct changes on the church anyway. No one group has had control over the Bible to change it on any global scale. Any changes that did occur uh, happened at a local level and not global. We've also got the traditions of the church that we can consider. 
If we assume for a moment that the New Testament was a book that was being added and subtracted to, then what type of additions and subtractions would you expect? I think it's reasonable to say that the changes would be ones that support the church's teaching. But consider the following. When we go through the New Testament, we don't see the word Trinity in there, even though that was a very popular word. It wasn't just added in. Or in the early church, the use of icons, the use of images in worship became normal practice. Yet the Bible never says to do that, and we never have that type of thing happening. In fact, the book of Acts records the Apostle Paul put the image makers out of business. And if we consider Mary, we see that uh, by that time, in the early years of the church, only after a few hundred years, uh, Mary becomes, starts to be worshipped as the Queen of Heaven, that she remains a virgin forever and that you can pray to her. Yet in Luke 11:27, Jesus says that you can be more blessed than Mary if you obey God's word. Now, why wasn't that changed? Because it's saying that any Christian believer can be more blessed by obeying the word of God. The types of changes that we would expect if the Bible was an open book are not present. We also, of course, have uh, many uh, thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament going back in fragments to the early centuries. Now, there are small differences between these. They're not all absolutely identical. But because we have different manuscripts from different regions, when we do see a difference... We can look and we see a difference in one region. We can compare it to other regions. And if the other regions don't have that difference, we can just deduct and say, well, that's an error that's crept in. Maybe someone's made a mistake, a deliberate or in, uh, uh, unintentional one. But these manuscripts that we have, and the, the uh, mainline scholars will say, show that the New Testament has been well preserved. It's also, I think, fair to say that the preservation, we, uh, the preservation of the Bible is seen in the coherence of all the prophets being together. Because throughout all the Bible, we have the sacrifice for sin being spoken about through Moses, through Isaiah, through all the prophets, finding its fulfilment in Jesus. Again, we have God with us in the garden, God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, and God walking with us in Jesus. We have the image of God being there in the book of Moses, in the Psalms, and prophets like David, and in the gospel, and the doctrine of the Son of God for the Messiah and God's people being through all the prophets. But there's one more point I'd like to point out for Muslims to consider, and that is the Quran's attitude to the Bible. In Surah uh, uh, 384, we read this. We believe in Allah and in what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob and the tribes and in the books given to Moses, Jesus and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one another among them. Now, often when Muslims look at this, they say, yeah, that was the, the, prophet, the scriptures of Moses and Jesus, but not of what Christians have today. Yet if you read there, when it talks about these books, it makes it clear. It says, those who follow the messenger Muhammad, the prophet who can neither read nor write, whom they will find described in the Torah and the gospel, which are with them. So it's speaking about the books that were actually uh, with the Christians and the Jews at that time. In fact, in Surah 10, verse 49, Muhammad himself is commanded to read these scriptures if he's in doubt. We see that Muhammad actually respected these scriptures. We see here it says, narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, a group of Jews came and invited the apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, to Kuf. So he visited them in the school. They placed a cushion for the apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, who sat on it and said, bring the Torah. When uh, It was then brought. Then he withdrew the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it, saying, I believe in thee and in him who revealed thee. You see, that is Muhammad making no distinction. There are actually verses in the Quran saying that uh, unbelieving Jews and Christians mistreated the scriptures. But this does not mean that the faithful Christians did and lost it. In fact, there are similar verses about the Quran being torn to pieces and people selling it for profit. And so similar types of statements that are made about unfaithful Christians are also made about unfaithful Muslims. So to conclude, I ask Islamic leaders not to exaggerate on these points. Both the Bible and the Quran have had a process of being collected and have small variants within them, but yet they are well preserved when we look at the evidence. And I'd like to finish by talking about my own experience. When I believed the gospel and became a Christian, I started to read and love the earlier prophets that were before Jesus in the Old Testament, even though some of them were hard to, stand, uh, hard to understand. But when I've seen people become Muslim, they've actually turned away from those prophets and they now only listen to what Muhammad says. Who turns people away from the prophets? Is it God or Satan? Who turns people, uh, God turns people to his prophets so that they can turn and have life. 
And that's what I pray that all of us will do here today, that we'll believe the prophets uh, and read them on their own. And so I invite you today to, um, to read the prophets, to, to read the Bible and find out what the prophets said. There are cards and you can read it also on my website. Thank you. Thank you.